Greetings and salutations, friends. So, let's talk a little bit about the fall of Cadia, shall we? Try and summarise some of the events and see if we can figure out what the fuck just went on. Right, to begin with, uh, fall of Cadia, as I mentioned in the talk with Ego Queen, I, I feel like this was somewhat rushed. As if Games Workshop were just kind of panicking, going like, oh, we haven't advanced the storyline in, what, 30 fucking years? So we really need to hurry right now for some godforsaken reason, but, oh well. We start off with um, a little of an odd thing, which kind of sets the tone for the entirety of the book. A ridiculously vague hint with the Saint Celestine saying that she was part of a grand design unfulfilled. Considering that she is one of the Emperor's many, many ethereal brides, that has to have something to do with Big E himself. However, grand design unfulfilled. What, was the Emperor trying to make himself an army of superpowered ghost women at some point? Wouldn't put it beyond him, but still. Now, what is kind of interesting, though, is there is a little cryptic hint in one of the Horus Heresy books with Malkador the Sigilite saying that uh, he told the Emperor to make the Primarch sisters. And yeah, this is a fucking stretch and a half, but maybe? Maybe she was supposed to be a Primarch? Maybe she's one of the lost Primarchs. I, I have virtually nothing to base that on other than the idea of a grand design unfulfilled, but eh, it's something. Honestly, this is one of many little hints throughout this book that are so remarkably obscure and just completely and utterly fucking devoid of context that it's virtually impossible to make an educated guess from it. So yeah, maybe, maybe, or she could just be talking about how she and Biggie had this whole fucking wedding trip planned out, but they didn't get to go because Horus decided to break all of the pottery, entirely possible as well. Anyways, moving swiftly onwards from the dead wife of the Emperor, we return once again for the 13th time to fail but on the hopeless. The most impotent villain since Darth Maul, existing only to kill off two-bit side characters and to look vaguely frightening in a dim lighting. Having reloaded a previous saved game, Abaddon decided to start the 13th Black Crusade all over again. Because the last time Games Workshop pulled this nonsense, it didn't quite go their way, and so now we're here once a goddamn again. Hopefully for the last time. And all of this retconning has to do with Games Workshop's desperate desire to make Failbadon the Harmless look like even a tiny bit of a threat on the grand scheme of things. So far they have been failing rather horribly, but I'm sure they'll continue trying. The newest excuse is that he was aiming at a collection of pylons created by the Necrons all along, blowing them up from orbit, thereby weakening their hold upon the Eye of Terror. Except, of course, it did absolutely no such thing, until the magical MacGuffin on Cadia itself exploded. And to be honest, it seems like a bit of a stretch to call randomly bombarding dead rocks in space a master plan, especially considering that all of this still hinges upon the simple fucking fact that Abaddon could simply just have sailed past Cadia on god knows how many fucking occasions. Yet Disappoint Madon the Armless is a remarkably cooperative movie villain who has decided to land his forces and bleed them half to death on Cadia at every single opportunity. <sighs> Abaddon, you shameful little boy, you. If it wasn't for the fact that Abaddon had supposedly burned his dream father Horus's corpse, you could bet your shiny little ass that Horus would be spinning in his grave at such a velocity that if you managed to stick a generator to him, the sheer rotational energy could probably produce enough electricity to power the entirety of the fucking Imperium. To be honest, the best move for Chaos at this point would be to replace Abaddon with anyone else. It has taken him 10 years to destroy a single planet with the full backing of the Chaos Pantheon. I am pretty damn sure that somewhere in the Chaos Fleet there is a lobotomized servitor that could have done it faster. But enough about Crapadon, let's move on a little bit. We are introduced to several more characters, one of them being Trazen the Eternal, who likes to collect humans and other living creatures for his voyeur fetish. He has decided that he's going to help Cadia because of, well, plot reasons primarily, but he does have a vague reason in that if Chaos wins, his ass is probably well and truly fucked, but 
Other than that, he's a good guy now because GW says so. But at least Trazin has some sort of motivation. Firstly, it's just interesting, which is good enough for him, and secondly, he doesn't want Chaos to win, so I can kind of see the reasoning behind this. Bielakor opening a goddamn warp rift on the fucking phalanx of all places, on the other hand, now that I have a damn hard time swallowing. I mean, never mind the simple fact that the Phalanx is one of the most heavily warded places in the goddamn galaxy, but it's also just the idea that he would decide to appear on the Phalanx. And his plan is he's going to take over the Phalanx and use it to bombard Terra. If you can open up a warp rift on the Phalanx, one of the, as I mentioned, most heavily warded places in the goddamn galaxy, what precisely is stopping him from opening a warp rift in the Emperor's own throne room, or just somewhere on Terra, you know, warp rift a gigantic fuck-off bomb into the Imperial Palace or something? And yes, yes, I know, the warp has always been a bit of a MacGuffin thing in 40k these days, with it being able to do whatever the fuck it wants to do, and teleporting Bilakor and a bunch of Iron Warriors who decided, you know what, this one-way trip to Terra sounds like a damn good idea, because even if they do manage to take over the Phalanx somehow, and conveniently all of the Imperial Fists were out on the field trip, even if they did that, now where the hell are they going to go? They're surrounded by Battlefleet Solar. And granted, yeah, the Phalanx is powerful, but did you bring enough dudes to man it? Hell, do you even know how to? I mean, you have the infectious scrap code, but the thing with scrap code is it fucks everyone. It doesn't mean that the Chaos Warriors would be any better at controlling the Phalanx just because the systems are essentially fried. This plan just seems like... A really, really, really bad plan, primarily made to somehow get the Phalanx to appear at Cadia. And, oh god, okay, so. The Imperial Fist obviously beat Bilakor's tiny little bitch ass because he can never get anything right. If Failbadon is a hopeless case, Bilakor is the little bitch that even Failbadon can beat and feel good about himself. So now the Imperial Fist, along with the Legion of the Damned, cool to see those guys by the way, they're one of my favourite little pieces of obscure fluffiness, because they're essentially demons of the Emperor, and that is fucking cool. Anyways, the fiery Astartes pop onto the Phalanx, rape whatever is left of the demons, and send Belakor screaming back into the wall with a brand new butt ache, before deciding to head to Cadia. Now, they entered into the warp blind near Terra, and they're going to appear over Cadia in less than a week. And yeah, sure, the warp is capricious, no doubt about that, but that was damn bloody quick. If you can travel from Terra to Cadia in a week, why the fuck isn't Battlefleet Solar raping Abaddon's tiny little tushy wishy right about now? I mean, what goddamn sense does this make? Okay, the Cadian battle fleet is pretty goddamn huge, but it was crippled by internal treachery and all kinds of nonsense that Abaddon had put in place via the powers of the warp. Okay, MacGuffany nonsense, but fine. However, what is the point of having the battle fleet solar just wait in terror? It's like, oh, it's a strategic reserve. Yeah, it's a strategic reserve whose main force has already been defeated. This is the time you send in the reserves, because what is the fucking point in letting Cadia fall right now? You could help it, in fact it would be massively beneficial to aid Cadia, and make use of what remains of its fleet, the Adeptus Statis contingents, the bloody phalanx who decided to wander off in that direction for some mysterious reason, not to mention the planetary weapons. Why would you not help Cadia at this point? And it's not like Abaddon could just go like, oh, Battlefleet Solar is here, I'm just gonna warp to Terra now. No, he is engaged in a planetary assault. Best case scenario, he is weeks away from a jump point. The Battlefleet Solar would have plenty of times to get back ahead of Abaddon. And that's assuming that they even let him get away in the first place. This all just sounds rather bloody silly to me, but oh well. So, returning to Cadia then. Abaddon has with him one of the Blackstone Fortresses, the most useless goddamn things ever. They are literally the Death Stars of the 40k universe. They have achieved precisely dick. 
And this is despite the fact that they have been built up as these incredibly powerful battle stations. Not only do they have ridiculous amounts of anti-ship weaponry, they can also gather up to destroy entire planets and solar systems in single blasts, just like a certain Death Star. And yet, they achieve precisely nothing. And that's despite the fact that there were goddamn six of them. Hell, this is one of the few cases in which Star Wars actually probably did a better job. Even that ridiculously useless Death Star planet from the latest movie, who must have taken goddamn decades of constructions and incredibly vast amounts of resources and ended up doing... Dick, it destroyed the Republic, who so far has done nothing in Star Wars lore. It's just a bunch of old dudes on the planet going like, yeah, should we declare war on the Empire yet? Nah, we'll leave it up to the goddamn rebels. They seem to be doing a remarkably good job so far, despite the fact that they haven't gotten any fucking backing on military aid. Whew, okay, Arch, chill out. Let's not get into a Star Wars rant. So, this Blackstone Fortress is capable of destroying entire planets, and the inhabitants' original plan is apparently to just wander it up to Terra and destroy the planet. Alright. So far so good, Abaddon is actually using his brain for once, but unfortunately the Imperium has discovered a MacGuffin capable of defending against the Blackstone Fortress's beam, despite the fact that this is virtually impossible by Imperial's technological standards, but hey. However, one of the pylons shielding KD against the Blackstone weapons has been damaged, and there's no way of repairing it in time except then the Elva pop in and repair it instantaneously, because fuck you. I swear to god, that pylon being damaged serves only to inform the reader that there are Eldar around, and that's pretty much it. And I'm assuming it was the Eldar, because Trazin won't show up for a short while yet. Now, don't ask me how the Eldar figured out how to work Necron technology, but hey. You should be getting used to things not making a whole lot of sense at this point. But the good news is that now it finally gets good. The battle raging across Cadia is written in a very, very nice way. They're really cool and they sound awesome. I would have liked to see more details since they essentially just focus entirely around a small portion of Cadia, ignoring everything else. And yeah, there's some silly shit like Creed himself, the High Commander of the Imperial Forces on Cadia, standing five meters behind the battle lines, where he can't possibly do any goddamn good as anything but a glorified figurine. But hey, all in all, it's written pretty damn nice. And it all leads up to various MacGuffins, and this is really the weakness of the book. Things just kinda happen without any real rhyme or reason. Trazin shows up and tells Crawl, who has been discovering the secrets of the pylons, how to fix it. And apparently, how to turn the pylon on Cadium into a weapon to try and close the Eye of Terror itself. In fact, he manages to fire this weapon, and the Eye of Terror shrinks drastically over a very, very short span of time. In fact, it sounds like it took minutes at most. However, Kroll's very, very ambitious plan to close the Eye of Terror for all eternity doesn't really work. He gets stopped by Abaddon of the Black Legion, who, for some mysterious reason, knew what he was doing. You could argue that Abaddon was simply heading for the last pylon, but that seems like a complete and utter waste of resources. The pylons themselves are not in a very strategically important position, and they are in by far the most well-defended positions. And Abaddon has no reason to suspect that the pylons could be used as a weapon against the Eye of Terror, so it seems kind of odd why he would focus on going there instead of taking care of the resistance around Cadia, and then focusing on taking out this last bastion, which is by far the best defended. It simply does not make any sense for Abaddon to head directly for the most heavily defended part of Cadia for no apparent goddamn reason. Again, there's little strategic value and taking out the pylons, well, that might as well happen afterwards. Because the real odd thing is, he also has a plan to destroy Cadia. For some reason, the Blackstone Fortress that mere moments ago had got blasted out of the sky by the Phalanx, who just kind of appeared in near space orbit above Cadia, which is in and of itself fucking impossible, but hey, details, just annihilated in mere moments and then decided to hang out over the pylon field. Another reason why Abaddon probably shouldn't head directly towards that, because he'd have to fly right under the guns of the goddamn Phalanx, which is a bad idea, but hey, minor fucking details, right? 
Anyways, Abaddon had apparently planned for his Blackstone Fortress getting blown up by a random space fortress that just happened to jumble by in the battle. <laughs> Fucking right. Anyways, he had planned for it to get destroyed and had left several tech priests on board with instructions to ram the remains of the Blackstone Fortress into Cadia itself. How the hell any of the engines in that thing have remained intact enough, not to mention powered enough to do that, God only bloody knows, but hey. So Abaddon had already planned to destroy the planet, and yet now he decides to put himself in danger for no apparent reason, and to put himself in the absolute greatest amount of danger he possibly fucking could. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but hey, he was there, he stopped Kroll from closing the Eye of Terror, and managed to destroy the last pylon, therefore allowing the Eye of Terror to grow ever wider and engulf Cadia. But for some reason, despite the fact that Cady is now entirely under the influence of chaos, the Chaos Gods decide to not simply cover the entirety of the planet in demons and let large quantities of humans escape, along with the Saint Celestine, the Inquisitor Grey Fox, and pretty much everyone else that's actually important. An odd choice by the gods there, but uh, hey, God works in mysterious ways and the Chaos Gods even more so, I suppose. After having made their escape from the demon world, some bloody how, the remainder of the Imperial forces escape along with the Phalanx to the System Edge. Originally, Abaddon doesn't want to follow them, because he's a lazy little bitch. However, he's given a single name, and a hint that this one person is held in a stasis chamber aboard the Ark Mechanicus vessel. The name drives Abaddon into a fit of rage and orders an immediate pursuit of the Imperial forces. Now, again, we have no bloody clue who this is, there's virtually nothing in the way of hints, it's just a name that pisses off Abaddon. And we're not really going to have any hints until either the Horus Heresy's book series is entirely done and we can try and extrapolate something from that, or if the uh, Call of Cadia series just flat out tells us. Personally, I'd love for it to be Loken, or maybe little Horus Aximand, who always hated the way Chaos was working, and I'm pretty sure he might probably try some kind of rebellion stuff in the future maybe. That'd be pretty cool. Or hell, maybe it's Horus. Maybe Abaddon didn't actually destroy Horus's body, maybe that was just a clone, because that would be fucking hilarious. If Horus somehow, some way lived through that, and now decides to wake up 10,000 years in the future and bitch slap Failbadon. That would be glorious to the point where I'm willing to overlook the nonsensical plot points in such a development. Regardless of who it is, it's unlikely that we'll be told any time soon, especially since it's a bit unclear what actually happened to this stasis chamber. You see, the Ark Mechanicus vessels were hit by a plot point when trying to escape the system and were left back with Abaddon's fleet. The Ark Mechanicus vessel was abandoned by its occupants, the Saint Celestine, Crawl, Inquisitor Greyfax, a bunch of Black Templars, that kind of stuff, and they escaped onto a planet where they were later rescued by Eldar, because of bloody course they were. And there's no real clear indication as to whether or not they actually brought the stasis chamber with them, although I have to assume, yeah, because, I mean, truly the Adeptus Mechanicus themselves know what's so important with the stasis chamber, right? I mean, come on, they have to. Oh, and speaking of Eldar, the Eldar and the Dark Eldar are now working together in harmonious relationships, which is complete and utter bullshit by the way, but at the very least you could make the argument that they are desperate allies of sort. Both of them cannot let Chaos win because Linish will eat their collective souls, which would be very, very, very bad indeed, and as such they manage to put aside their uh, differences. Although, even that is kind of insane. I mean, on one hand, the Eldar are taught their entire existence to suppress everything, to suppress their emotions, their desires, to make sure that they don't burst out into full blossom, therefore potentially creating another Chaos God. And on the other hand, you have the Dark Eldar, who are taught to indulge in every excess, to hide themselves from she who thirsts. These are really, really massive fucking differences that would make cooperation virtually impossible in most cases. 
But oh well, I'm willing to accept it simply because they are bloody desperate at this point, and they are finally going to ally with the Imperium as a whole, apparently, which is quite interesting. I'm hoping that they'll be a bit better at diplomacy this time than the last time they tried to do this. The Eldar have on several occasions attempted diplomacy with the Imperium, but have pretty much always fucked it up by being utterly and completely intolerable cunts. And with that, the fluff part of the book is pretty much over. And if you want to see what happens next, you're probably going to have to fork over at least another 30 euros, and then probably another 30 euros on top of that, putting the entire book series probably something along the lines of 100 euros. Now, honestly, I don't think the book is worth 30 euros to begin with, but... The entirety of the series, if you can get a decent deal on it, would maybe be worth it, just from a reading perspective. As for the rule set, well, there is a distressing lack of scenarios. There's only four scenarios in this, which is kind of shit, and there's not a whole lot of interesting units. You basically got the three heroes. You've got Saint Celestine, you've got Kroll, and you've got Inquisitor Grey Fox. That's it. Like, you don't get any real new formations or units or anything cool it just it all feels kind of lacking to be honest because this was supposed to be a big event you know this was supposed to be huge the fall of cadia i had expected something along the lines of an imperial armor book with lots of cool new units formations rules scenarios and everything and what we get is just not that Instead, what we get is Games Workshop's take on clickbait, in my honest opinion. They decide, let's put out a book with the title The Fall of Cadia, make it sound all epic and incredible, like we're really going to advance the story now, and at the end of it, you're not really any wiser than you started. Okay, so Cadia has fallen, and... I mean, that's interesting, I guess, but that doesn't really change anything at this point. Considering how Abaddon is such an utter and complete ding-dong that he keeps stopping at every single planet that challenges him, all you really need to do to establish a new Cadian gate is to have a planet constantly broadcasting signals saying fuck Abaddon in his shiny little metal ass. It's going to be interesting to see where they're going to go from here, because this book felt a bit rushed and half-assed, with a lot of very, very silly plot nonsense and MacGuffins, which is not something I'm really that happy to see in a major 40k storyline. However, I will reserve final judgement until we can actually get some more information about where they're going to take this, so until then, I think that's all for The Fall of Cadia. I'll probably be following this series, because it looks like it might be going in interesting places, so until next time, I've been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.